Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Leandro Alves de Oliveira from Goonia, Brazil. Leandro is an orthopedic surgeon specialized in hip surgery. His activities concern hip preservation, pelvis tibular trauma, and hip replacement surgeries. He leads the hip trauma department in the Urgency Hospital of Goonia. He's also the coordinator of the orthopedic surgery service of the General Hospital of Goonia and hip surgeon of the Federal University of Goiás. Leandro is former president of the Middle West region of the Brazilian Hip Society and is currently the president of the regional voice of the Brazilian Orthopedic Society. If you notice, Dr. Leandro has delivered a couple of lectures on a channel that's already reached a huge audience. And today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Leandro Elvis D. Oliveira for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Leandro. Hello, everybody. Thank you once more, Dr. Hitesh Gopalan, for this invitation to talk in your live program once more. And uh, um, you asked me to talk about the complications of trochanteric fractures and salvages. These are the, the hospitals that I work here in Guayana. And uh, I like to say that I have no potential conflict of interest in this lecture. And uh, when we to understand the complications of the trochanteric fractures, we will do a, a soon review of the early mechanical complications. We will try to identify the nature of these complications and uh, even and, and try to identify the risk factors and how to control them during or after the surgery. Uh, and uh, we will talk something about how to treat the early mechanical complications of the trochanteric femur and also the late complications. Uh, and uh, I will bring you some clinical case and in the end, some, some messages to take home. This is an article written by our group here in Goiânia and published in the Brazilian Orthopedic Journal. Uh, the proximal femoral fractures are the third most common fracture in the emergency room, and it has great rates of mortality and morbidity because uh, due to its high incidence in the, in the elderly. And we have different devices to try to treat these, these fractures. And the most common uh, devices that we, we use is the dynamic hip screw, that is the DHS, and the proximal femoral nailing, that's the PFM. And the causes of the early mechanical complications is the incorrect fixation or the bad reduction of the fracture. We can have also a secondary displacement that we can note during the follow-up of the fracture and uh, the fixation failure that can happen due to the wrong choice of the implant that we use to fix the the fracture and even the uh, when we do a bad reduction of the fracture. And sometimes it can occur the fracture distal to the hardware. The late complications, the most common are the infection, the secondary vascular necrosis after the fixation of the fracture, no, no, the non-union can occur, and uh, even the malunion of the trochanteric uh, fracture, as you can see in this X-ray. Uh, the rate of these early mechanical complications are not defined in the literature, but we can find in some articles that the secondary displacement, the fixation failure can occur in five to 7%. Fractures distal to the implants are rare, can occur in one to 3%. And the most common um, complications are that one specific to the neck head implants, just like the cutout, the cut through, and the effect that can occur in 10% of the cases. Uh, the, to understand the risk factors of the of uh, to, uh, the risk factors to occur this kind of complications. We have to understand the factors related to the patients, related to the fracture itself, related to the chosen treatment. Treatment, if you can have the, a good choice of the implant or the device that you use to fix the fracture, and even if you do it surgical in the right surgical technique. The risk factors related to the patients are associated with osteoporosis, 
in, in this disease, we have a lower bone quality, and it's more common in the female gender uh, in older age and uh, in the Caucasian patients. And uh, it's also associated with uh, inflammatory disease uh, when we have a thinner bone trabecular. Uh, the risk factors related to the fracture, the first thing we have to do is to do the classification of the fracture to, and to understand if it is a stable or unstable fracture. The, the classification that I use in almost of, uh, all cases that I have is the AO uh, classification. Um, the, the A1 type, it's the stable fracture that we have just a line here in the, in the trochanteric zone. The A2 classific, uh, type uh, happens when we have the combination of the medial posterior wall, and we have the A3 type when we have the commitment of the lateral wall of the trochanter. This in, so we have the various instability when we have the calcar comminution and uh, even the lesser trochanter fracture. The impaction instability occurs when we have the metaphysial comminution and the lateral cortex fracture and, uh, and associated with the greater trochanter comminution. So these are uh, types of fracture that is more unstable and the risk of failure can um, is higher. Um, the, and the risk factors related to the chosen treatment, uh, once more, it's important to do the classification of the fracture. Uh, as I said before, I use the AO classification, and it's important to determine if it's a stable or an unstable fracture so that we can choose the right treatment for each case. In the stable fractures, we can use all implants are appropriated to do, to do the fixation of the fracture. We can use the dynamic hip screw, that's the DHS, and the, we can also use the, the proximal femoral nailing with a good success and good results in the post-operative. Post this, this is a case that uh, you use the DHS and another one that I use the PFN with good results that is, these are stable fractures. In the complex fractures, it, uh, we have better results when we use intramedullary implants. They are near the focus of the fracture so we can do a better stabilization of them. The, and uh, the distal fractures, uh, low, uh, the distal fractures is lower in the DHS, and we have a higher incidence of this kind of fractures when you use the, the PFM. The factors, the risk factors related to the surgical technique is associated in the, the basic requirement that we have to have a good result is the head position of the head neck implant. And uh, uh, we use the this index, that's the TAD index, to, to have a, a guarantee that our fixation will not, will not fail. And so uh, the TAD, we have uh, this index when we do the sum of the distance of the screw in the AP view and in the profile view, view and uh, the result has to be less than 25 millimeters. The superior position of the screw increases the risk of failure. And uh, when the screw is in the anterior position of the femoral head, it's the position that we have uh, more damage of the femoral head. And uh, the poor quality of the reduction is also, um, is all, uh, we have also, worse results when we don't, we don't uh, do a good uh, reduction of the fracture. And uh, how can we treat these early mechanical complications? We can treat it in three manners. The only the observation, 
a conservative surgical treatment. In this, uh, we can do the revision of the internal fixation or the subtrochanteric osteotomy. And in some cases, we can do this as uh, secondary arthroplasty. The observations is indicated when the patient is very old and he has uh, reduced autonomy and uh, when he does not or his family he refuses the treatment or when we have a contraindication to anesthesia. The, the, we can sometimes, we can only change or or take off some screws. And this happens when we have a distal screw too long, a screw protruding into the joint, and a screw too long later. In this case, as I said, we can change the screw or even take it away. Uh, the revision of the internal fixation is indicated when we have poor reduction or poor fixation. And in this case, we have to pay attention to the position of the cephalic implant. Uh, the valves indu inducing subtrochanteric osteotomy is indicated especially in no union or malunion, as we can see in this, in, in this X-ray, a non-union of this fracture. And uh, the sub subtrochanteric osteotomy have a, has a satisfactory outcome. And as uh, disadvantages, we have the deformity of the proximal femur, and sometimes we can medialize the, the femoral shaft. In this case, that's a case of no union that I did this osteotomy and in valgus with a good result. When uh, this is an example of a fracture distal to the implant, and in the same case, we had a no union of the, the trochanter, trochanteric fracture. So what I did was the subtrochanteric osteotomy to treat the non-union, and then I fixed the distal fracture with a DFN. The secondary arthroplasty is indicated in older patients when we have a damage of the articular surface of the acetabulum, and uh, it's not easy to do arthroplasty after a trochanteric fracture. It's uh, technically demanding because the malunion and the non-union, even the holes of the screw of the plate, uh, we, they change the normal anatomy of the femoral, the proximal femur, and it takes more difficult to perform a total hip arthroplasty in this case. And the risk of dislocation, infection, and, and the periprosthetic fracture are higher in these patients. And to prevent the periprosthetic fracture, I use long stems to protect the, the proximal femur. Late complications, this is an example of a malunion that we treated it you, uh, doing a subtrochanteric osteotomy. The avascular necrosis of the femoral head treated with a total hip replacement. The uh, deep infection that we did the resection of the femoral head and the implant. Uh, we use a spacer with an antibiotic, and in a second time, we did the total hip replacement. And uh, in some cases, we, the, the uh, trochanteric fracture can develop two osteoarthritis, and in these cases, we do a total hip, total hip replacement. These are three cases of non-union and uh, a var uh, varus deficiency of the proximal femur that was resolved and we did a subtrochanteric osteotomy with valgus of these three cases with good results and a good follow-up. And how we do this, this plan, preoperative planning to do uh, the subtrochanteric osteotomy? This is an example uh, a uh, uh, virus deformity of the proximal femur. Then what we did is the, we did this preoperative planning in the paper. We cut this paper and did a model to show how would the, we do this um, subtrochanteric osteotomy. So we, in, here this, we showing 
how we did the how the we performed the subtrochanteric osteotomy in this case. So the mess, the conclusions, and there's some message to take home, or how uh, whenever we try to treat the trochanteric fracture, we have to identify risk factors of failure. We have to choose the right implant for each type of fracture. We have to do a good reduction, and uh, the valgus osteotomy is a good choice for salvage, and the hip replacement is a good is a good choice in appropriate cases. And I think that the most important uh, message is that we have to avoid complications in the, the trochanteric fracture. And we have to use all tools that's necessary to avoid these complications that can be catastrophic to the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leandro, for yet another amazing presentation. Uh, Leandro, a couple of questions from our side. How often have you seen avascular necrosis after trochanteric fractures? A vascular necrosis after trochanteric fracture is not common. It's more common in the femoral and neck fracture. Uh, what I can observe that the avascular necrosis after a trochanteric femur is more common when you did not place the, the head screw in the right position. When you, you place the, the screw in the anterior part of the femur or in the superior part, the risk of avascular necrosis is bigger. So the right position, as I said, is in the middle of the femoral head and you used to, to observe if it's correct and implanted uh, using the TAD index. Thank you, Leandro, for that. And uh, you mentioned that uh, one of the treatment options for a, a non-union of uh, intertrochanter is uh, doing a subtrochanteric valgus osteotomy, right? So have you encountered any non-union with an osteotomy. I mean, osteotomy is notorious to produce a complicated, I mean, a non-union. So in this particular, you put a blade plate there as a rigid device. And is there a potential for a non-union there again? No, uh, no. Uh, I, all cases that I treated with a subtrochanteric osteotomy in non-union, I have good result. Uh, I think that it happens for, and it explained it, that it happens for two reasons. The first reason is that when we do the subtrochanteric osteotomy, we, we optimize the irrigation, the, the blood irrigation that region. So we do a biological re reaction that improves the, the healing of the, the fraction and the osteotomy. The second reason is that we correct the uh, normal biomechanics of the hip and uh, if we do this correction and the fracture it's a, that was vertically and we become it horizontally, the compression forces in the osteotomy and in the non-union will result in a healing of the, of the fracture. Thank you, Leandro. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Uh, Leandro, do you use a trochanteric fixation nail or a PFNA2? which has a spiral blade for a intertrochanteric fracture. Is it available in this part, in your part in Guernia? And what is the experience? I have, a, I have a few experience using this kind of device because it's more expensive, but I have already used it and the results is, is very good. Um, I, I think, to, uh, uh, but, Another kind of device, but I don't like to use, is the device that we can use with uh, cement, doing an augmentation of the femoral head using cement. But I don't like to use this because I have already seen cement in the joint space. It's a catastrophic result. 
Uh, Leandro, you do a lot of uh, hip surgeries. I mean, you've seen a lot of these uh, failed trochanter fractures and all those com coming to you. I mean, uh, operated elsewhere and they come to you. Because I'm particularly concerned about this particular device called as a PFN A2, or what it's called, where we use a spiral blade. And I've seen complications like the uh, spiral blade going into the joint inside, yes, yes. migrating inside, and also in some cases there's a lateral wall fracture later on. So yes, what has yes. it been your experience on that? Yes, uh, that's what we call the, the cut through. The cut through is, is happens when the, the screw or the spiral blade go through the joint. Um, that happens when you do not use a lock in the in the point of the the nailing so you can it's something that happened and it can happen too because when we have the uh, big impaction so when you have a com metaphysical comminution the risk of happening the cut through is bigger because uh, uh, instead of the the screw comes laterally it can goes medially and uh, go through the the space joint that's so have you uh, encountered any of those complications done elsewhere coming to you or in your unit? Yes, and uh, when it happens, what we do is the total hip arthroplasty. Uh, you don't have a <laughs> final other... solution. Yes, the final solution. Okay, thank you, Leandro. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you, Leandro, for yet another brilliant presentation, and we really look forward for another one in the future. I. I appreciate, I appreciate be here once more. And uh, what I want to say is that it's very good to talk about what we like to do. So it's me, it's very good to talk about hip surgery. And I hope that everybody that uh, watch this video like it. Thank, Thank you. you very Bye. much.